In this video, I'm going to talk about editing workflow for a documentary, how to structure and organize your project, but also how to build a strong story narrative. And who am I? I'm Johnny von Wallström, and my last film sold to Netflix. If you're new around here, consider subscribing. This channel is all about documentary filmmaking. Now, let's start the show. Okay, back. Uh, so, today we're gonna talk about editing workflow. Uh, I don't know, that intro, hmm, gotta do some more work on it. Anyway, DaVinci Resolve editing. I guess, like for everybody that's young, this is natural to edit in DaVinci Resolve. Um, let me know though, is the audio okay, or all that, so that we don't go on without knowing that. Um, but the thing is, like when you look at editing softwares, everybody talk about like Final Cut, Premiere, uh, Avid, everybody professional talk about Avid at least. Uh, but DaVinci Resolve, I've used all of them. Uh, I've used uh, Final Cut on feature films, I've used it on television, uh, I've used uh, Premiere on television, a lot of commercials. Uh, Avid I've only worked a little bit in, so I don't know that in and out like I do the other programs. But besides that, like Resolve is on the level with the other programs. So in this session, I thought I would just like go through how I structure things in Resolve. Uh, and since I know how the other programs work, I can kind of reference how that would work in that context uh, as well. Uh, but I just think that Resolve is a super powerful editor because of how it handles metadata. And that's what I want to kind of start with. Uh, but any questions you have, drop them in here. I have a couple of questions that are kind of structured this whole thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, editing workflow, like how you bring media in, how you organize it. I'm also going to talk about like how you structure stories, uh, how you from coming from location, coming back, uh, kind of look at the material and then try to build a story from that. How do you do that? Uh, and how do you do when you work on big like commercial projects? It's it's like still just it's tiny. Th there's almost no material. You don't even actually need to log the thing. <laughs> but when you do documentaries, you really need to know like where everything is. And you have like interviews that are hours long and you need to know how can I find that thing that I heard like months or years ago. And then to find that when you really need it, you don't want to sit like for weeks trying to look for it. Uh, so that's why you need to structure your projects like super, super strict. Uh, that's like the key to actually being efficient in terms of doing a doc. Um, yeah, but let me just move this one so I can see your questions and everything. Um, the only thing that like, I just want to mention, like before you even get into the program, like how I just uh, handle things. Uh, but let me just upload this to Instagram. We're done. Handling the media, like on a shoot, what do I do? I usually have at least two backups. Yeah, that's crucial. If you don't have that, then you will be very sorry someday. So that's like the first step of everything. Uh, before I even come back to the editing suite, I have two backups. Uh, I structure those like not that well. I structure them by like character if I shoot a doc. So for instance, we have like three, I think, characters that we shot with in Kino. So I structure it like those and then the scenes. Um, not even the days. I, I don't, like, I'm not very fond of that way of structuring. I think a lot of people, they structure by days and everything. I just feels like it's hard to find things. I just want to look at the scenes. So uh, that's usually how I structure it. Uh, and then uh, if there's like B-roll of the town or something like that, I would put that in like the location, that type of foldering. Uh, but other than that, all the handling of the logging of the material, that's done in the program. Uh, and that's just because it's searchable much more easy, it's quicker, you can do like smart collections, all those things, uh, fancy organizing. Um, so that's, that's like just how I uh, kind of do it in the field. And then I also review that material 
uh, on location uh, like each night at least but even in the daytime like we talk about like what have we shot what do we need whoa light off That means that it's time to go home. So I'll see you guys another time. Uh, hope you had a fun time today. Okay, bye. Uh, I'm just kidding. But anyway, yeah, I just review the stuff. That, like that's what the editing process is for me. So when I come back, I review everything. That's how I write the script. I try to develop it in, in like the editing suite. But I also do that on location. So I always kind of look at the material, not in like a super detailed way, but I try to see like the key points of everything while I'm uh, on a location so that I can shoot like, okay, so we had a list of these scenes. We are not getting any of them. Which ones are we going to try to to get and why are we going to prioritize that over that? That's usually how it goes. Um, yeah, and then I just copy that to an edit drive when I get back and then I have a separate backup or several backups. You never know. Um, yeah, that's usually how it is. That's just like quick introduction to where I'm coming from before I'm even in the program itself. So I got a question here from Saulo Ribas. Hello, how do you organize your footage? Traditionally, some editors will have quotes and sound bites categorized, but I feel a very organic vibe from your work. I wonder if your editing process reflects that quality as well. Uh, and a follow-up question. When the editing begins, do you wait to have all the footage completed? Uh, best regards, very inspired uh, by your work. Yeah, thank you, Salo. Uh, usually, like I structure the things by shooting days. Um, and I go through like a rigorous process of logging everything, like I mentioned. I'm going to go through that and, and kind of like in detail kind of show what that is. But the more stuff that you can put in, the better. Uh, so I just try to organize everything so detailed that whatever you can think of in the end, two years from now, three years from now, ten years from now that you want to go back, you're able to do that. Uh, and that's the process of documentaries. Like you need to be that foolproof in terms of how long a project takes. Uh, so that's like an important part of it. Uh, but usually it goes like this. So I get into a program. Let me just switch here so you can see. So I get into Resolve. This is basically um, what I'm seeing. Uh, and You have the media panel here. Let me just collapse all this so you can see what like my template looks like. And also th this template that I'm using, it's in the description. So you can go get it for free. Uh, just click the link and, and you can download it. Uh, and what this template is, if we just look at like briefly uh, over here, this is what you can see. You have like all the the folders that I use um, so this is what it would look like if you kind of put it together uh, everything is like color coded and then you have like smart bins for a certain type of media um, and yeah the, how they end up there that's like a whole uh, other thing but just to kind of go in to the program and come in you come into the media section and you want to get stuff in here. I usually put them in the log uh, destination and then I go in and I start to organize everything. So here we have like okay behind the scenes footage. This isn't organized by the way I brought this in today. Um, so you have all the footage by days here and this is just how it's structured in uh, the offloading phase on location. So this is how like unstructured it is. Um, and then you have the scenes, which is basically, this could be something else. This could just be the characters or something like that as well. Uh, scenes is just what it usually is. So uh, you could change that. But here's like one character, another character, and a third character. And then in that you have the different scenes. Um, and like the first step of all of this is to just get that in, obviously. Uh, 
Uh, and once you have that, try to structure it in a way that, okay, now I know that all this material is here. Uh, and then I just usually go in and I have this section over here, which is all the media, which is like just um, collecting all the media. So uh, everything gets organized uh, or you just get all the media in the project. And then I would just go in and I would search. For instance, okay, I know that everything that is uh, dot .move, most of that is uh, the URSA. And then I know how the naming conventions of the URSA is. So I know that all these would be URSA. And then I could just go in and I could go into the metadata and I could just bring up my template here, which is like the logging template. And I've done this already. So I would just go and fill in uh, these things like, okay, angle, uh, environment, like uh, those things like environment and stuff. That's kind of hard because you just pick everything. So it's not going to be uh, the right thing. But if you know that most of the stuff is exterior, then you might as well write exterior. Uh, but then like the camera that's used, the location, camera type, uh, production name, production company, director, DOP, camera operator for that camera. Uh, and then uh, you would go and do that for all the different stuff that you have. So you would go like, okay, Maddie has the MXF files. So then you would go in and you would do it for Maddie as well. Um, and you would get all those files and you would do the same. And this is already uh, pre-done. So uh, I can just show you what it looks like. So it's just like, okay, camera operator, Maddie. And then from, uh, from like looking at uh, GH5 material, you would just go like MP4 and you would do that as well. So just, and that's not done. But trying to do as much as you can, just automize. Like, you don't want to do this on like every single file. You don't want to do it even on like 10 files. You want to do it as quick as you can. So just finding a way to like, okay, all the media, select that. Okay, I know that we have these cameras, select those, log them in have that organized straight away. Um, and then like all that information you can use later when you're trying to organize things by camera or whatever it is that you want to organize by. But the important thing is just to put in the metadata so that you have that and then you can start to structure from that uh, and kind of like, yeah, just filter things and you can do that even without having like these smart collections you could just go here and you could filter by whatever uh, like whatever it, it could be anything uh, and then get that filtered out and then you can look for things so I try to have them put in bins that are like the scene but I don't put like okay this scene this take or something like that I would just keep like all this stuff in that one that's basically how it would be uh, is this video going to be saved? Yes, it is. Uh, I'm even recording a second angle here. So I, I think this, hopefully, if this is good, unfortunately, I, I don't trust QuickTime to record like a screen capture. So if anybody knows a good screen capturing software that doesn't crash the computer, that always happens. Um, I don't know why, but it just does. So if you know anything uh, that works, let me know. Mac, Mac guy. When you shoot, uh, how do you know when it's enough? Do you ever stop and realize afterwards during the edit process that you should have left the camera on a little more? I mean, usually, usually that's the case. Um, it's always a problem. Uh, I think you always want to shoot more than you can. But when you do it for a while, you start to realize that you can't shoot everything. You're going to miss things. And you, once you accept that and you re realize that in the edit, that's when you try to piece stuff together and all those things that you miss, it's fine. You're going to have to find a different solution to it. It's going to be a creative way of, of solving a problem like everything else. And that's going to be a good thing for the story in the end. Uh, that's at least how I think about it. Uh, but you always regret the stuff that you miss and you knew you could have had um, but yeah you just live with it uh, okay so um, just quickly that that whole process that I was talking about just getting uh, the whole uh, media into uh, all of this 
I use the template as a starting ground, I get it in, and then I start to organize it. I put all this metadata on top of like all the files, try to structure everything. Uh, you can see here, if you look like what I have here, I don't write much more than this at this stage. This is just like the initial uh, metadata capturing. Um, and then once that's done, that's like the first batch. I organize it in bins if I feel like I need to organize it more in bins. Um, now I have it pretty much like I know I want it, so it's imported like I want it. Might rename something, but it's still the same material uh, in the scenes, I think. Uh, maybe there might be some things that you can like bring out of a, uh, of a recording scene to be more than one scene, but usually it's just like one scene or something like that. But I do bring out the interviews, so put those in a different folder. Uh, and all this is going to be transcribed once it's synced. But first I'm going to sync everything. So the first step is just put that metadata in and then start to organize everything. Um, and I got a question like how do you keep track of sound and picture? And sometimes it's messy. This time we used uh, a tentacle sync timecode device. Hopefully that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes something is wrong. and you know, it messes up, but like doing documentary, man, it's, it's a lot of manually <laughs> trying to like get all the material organized. Uh, just because in the field, you're so focused on capturing the story. And this might be something different if you're a bigger crew, uh, but if you are like a small, tiny crew, then you just have to accept that you're gonna have to do a lot of the stuff. Uh, and that's ju just the way it is. Uh, and I don't know, like for me, the most important thing for me is to capture the story. I think about like all the post-production, that's like then. But I'm comfortable enough because I've done this syncing so many times that like I can sync the stuff manually without like having to clap like I do most of the time when I think about it, I do that. And uh, when I have like dual audio, but it's just a matter of like structuring everything, going through everything and organizing it. So, okay, you know that all this stuff that is like signpost road, for instance, let me switch, let's go. Um, if you would look in like this folder, you would have like all these files, which is the audio, and then you would have these drone shots, and then you would have these shots, which is just uh, the stuff that needs to be synced. So I would just go in, I would guess that this is like, it's two takes. It's these two basically. So to organize that is not that hard. Uh, I would just put it on a timeline, uh, usually, uh, and then I would just like manually sync it if I didn't have time code. So this is in case it doesn't work. Sometimes it does work. But if it doesn't work, that's how I would do it. And then I would just like put all the clips out and I would find like reference points, which usually is like a loud uh, noise of some sort in the audio. And then you would try to dial those in. And then maybe you need to like frame fuck a little bit to get it uh, right. But that's usually how it goes. Like a lot of doc filmmakers do it like that because they focus so much on the story. So that's how I would like handle the whole syncing process. But hopefully things work and hopefully you have like the time code stuff working if you have those opportunities. But this is like for anybody that hasn't got that type of equipment. I didn't have it on those two films and it worked perfectly anyways. And I had dual audio on both of them. So it's not like it's that big of a deal. You just need to accept that it's time consuming. Um, yeah. Let me see here. Oh, it's so confusing to have a couple of screens. Um, yeah, so I do start like now when, okay, we put that metadata in, we put it in folders. The first thing I do is sync everything because I don't want to go and organize stuff too heavily like this is the stuff that I want I want like okay director DOP camera I don't want more than that first I want to sync everything and the reason you need to sync everything is because you want the metadata on those files you don't want it on the files that are not synced so uh, once you have synced everything 
you would then take like the next step and it's a little bit different if it's an interview and if it's like regular uh, material but I if it is like this type of material which is like a, a mix of interview and uh, and just like them as a scene walking around then you would probably like look at it as an interview separately and then you would do it as a scene separately uh, because the way I think about it is like okay you have the step when you edit all the scenes uh, which is basically going to be like your your draft that you then like put together to a story but then you also have the interviews which you need to basically transcribe I don't transcribe them I just go in and I write like every question that's asked then I kind of summarize what they talk about in the uh, in the answer and I make that into a clip uh, or uh, log that in like with markers or with keywords just just a simple way of doing it um, yeah that that's like the the basic process of it um, and I th see somebody's mentioning like pluralize here uh, I, I use like tentacle studio because I have tentacle sync that does the same thing but it works with time code instead so it works better when you have uh, your camera far away which happens all the time on docs so pluralize and final cut has it built in resolve has it built in uh, it syncs with the waveforms it's really good but it doesn't work all the time on docs so even if you use that you're going to have to manually sync things sometimes like if you do interviews and you do controlled situations it's going to be fine you're not going to have any issue but most of the time when you do run and gun type of documentaries that is not the case like shit is like moving around and you need to react to it and it's not sitting interviews that's not the type of docs that i do at least yeah those types of docs fine Th that's not even an issue to handle the media because it's just like okay clap even you have a clapper and or you should have if you do that type of thing because it's so simple but when you have run and gun you're not in charge of how things happen you just follow along and try to capture everything and that's like your priority so then it's gonna get messed up you're gonna be too far away you're gonna have people like way back there and then you're gonna be here and running to them and then like the audio won't sync as easily but sometimes it works most of the time it could in certain situations but it's not something that I would rely on. Um, yeah. Let me see. Uh, okay. So let me just finish up on this thought here. Yeah. So switch. That's me. So I've synced everything. That's when I do keywording, which is like the whole like keywording of a scene could be like you could keyword everything, like every little detail, like a pretty shot of a flare or whatever. It could be so detailed that it's insane because the more you do it, the more you're going to have a possibility of finding it. But there is also a different way of doing it in Resolve, which is creating sub clips. So for instance, if you had an interview, and then you would uh, have somebody talking about a th certain topic. You could just take that and do a sub clip of that. And then you could organize those uh, into folders or whatever it is that you want with uh, the interview. And then that's easier to kind of find. Um, that's probably how I'm going to do this. Um, and it, when you go through and you look for all the b-roll within the scenes that you do because maybe you have like for instance let's say we have this scene here you have them walking uh, yeah so a shot like this maybe this shot yeah so let's say we wanted this part here uh, I don't know just this part then you can make a sub clip out of that uh, create sub clip and then that would just be like creating a different clip um, all together so you would be able to like use that then as a, like a separate clip in the whole edit 
uh, but you're not making like new files or anything but all those things you don't want to do them before you've logged everything and done the syncing so that's just the way it goes um, but then after that you can do all that and, and kind of bring everything together um, where do you find music for films like different places but now for this film it's probably going to be epidemic sound um, and for like my last films both of them a friend of mine made the music and then for Pearl of Africa I made like the atmospheres for it so it, it kind of depends like usually it's so important to have like the rights cleared so you need to clear the rights for everything uh, and that's like a whole other chapter of this whole discussion but you need to clear everything and then uh, that's something that you should be more interested in than getting the, like the song that is popular or something like that because like it's going to be so insanely expensive if you don't know the people uh, so i would say do not try to get a famous song uh, and if you do then yeah hope it solves itself um, how do you get people to agree to interview for your documentary do you pay them yeah in the beginning i i never paid people i i just didn't know how it works but you should always pay per diem to people uh, and if you do that then it's also much easier process to get all the legal uh, stuff done because when you do an interview you have to have like sign off of everything straight away otherwise it's just time consuming and it's just dreadful to get it later uh, and when you do sell to Netflix or anybody else you have to have those in place because you need to get a um, uh, an insurance in order for you to be able to sell it so do it <laughs> uh, okay so what's the story guys this is like the biggest topic ever okay but let's just do it simple then so story is basically and this goes for like the universal uh, three act structure but the first act would be where you introduce the conflict and it would be where you put things at stake the second act would usually be like where you're trying to kind of uh, deepen that and like it's a rat race where you're trying to find a solution but nothing happens basically you're trying to get to the next stage but there's always problem in the way and you're not really getting to where you're trying to go and solving the conflict or the problem that the characters have and then the final one final act is usually like the resolution and where everything kind of uh, is put to it. it's like the point of no return basically um, and like after that people should have changed uh, like the character should have changed evolved in life uh, that's like my basic <laughs> understanding uh, of it every documentary doesn't fit into that structure most films are not obviously like your ideas are not gonna fit into that structure straight away but the more you shoot most films has to kind of rely on that simple formula because it's it's so like if if you're gonna stray away from it you need to be brilliant uh, or just have luck because it's so hard to get people to actually care about characters if you don't follow the structure that are out there for storytelling um, and if you can study up on that i would do that because it's going to help you to know which scenes you're going to shoot and you're not going to waste time shooting the wrong scenes uh, but at this stage when we were there we have a an idea of what the story is so we have a list of scenes that like okay these scenes could help to tell that story that doesn't necessarily mean that that story is going to be in the end uh, probably not but you need to have that type of uh, understanding of the story coming in and it's gonna be something that changes during the process of everything um, so let me just switch so I can just show you um, for all these like for instance like canoe at home sourdough soil sample festival ground all these scenes that we have with this character they're deliberate because they're trying to tell the greater story about the whole film narrative 
that's something that you should know when you go there the first time you should you should have done the research so that you know what you're after you should have done like pre-interviews with the characters the casting process should take a shitload of time so you know you have the right character when you get there um, this is a whole like different thing to to kind of dig into but i just feel like we were there like three days when we shot this time we have, I've never had this good material at any project at like, and especially at this short amount of time. And it's just because we had a different process, which we've pretty much taken from my commercial work, like how we work with docs for the branded content. That's how we've taken like inspiration from that into how we work with things today. So we got so much material for being there for only three days. Um, and I feel like we have like, basically almost like we have the the whole f like first act right now maybe i don't know at least the skeleton of it and just for three days but that comes down to knowing like what you're after and it comes down to structuring things um, according to like what you're trying to tell with the story uh, but then once i come back and have that material that's when like the process starts and you start to reevaluate what because that idea that you had coming in it's gonna have changed when you get back and that's what i'm trying to kind of uh, dig into now i'm gonna start like doing this whole process of like okay syncing everything up and then i'm gonna start edit all the scenes which is like the key to understand your story is to edit the scenes but i'm gonna come back to to the whole scene things um but then there's also like this i do a lot of voiceover on on the youtube channel with me uh, in pearl of africa there's like a voiceover with cleo uh, in my first film there was wasn't the voiceover i think everything is just like told through interviews but the thing is like you can do voiceover in so many different ways and it's usually frowned upon as like a cheap way of of uh, telling a story because usually you want to have the characters reveal everything just by being themselves so the way i think about it is like you if you want to do voiceovers you should do them pretty late in the process um, and you should do them from a personal perspective of the story so if you're a part of the story as a filmmaker then it makes sense that you might do it but otherwise i would do it from the character's perspective uh, and until that happens i'm probably just gonna be working with like drafts of what the voice is or it's gonna be like cut together and maybe it works but when i work with uh, like short docs i usually record um, just like the voice uh, as a separate interview we didn't do this for for this uh, shoot here but usually i would not film anything now we've shot everything like pretty much organic as we've moved around so it's a little bit different and that's going to be more tedious as well to like sync and do all that um, but uh, just to finish up like the whole story thing but before we can talk about the, the like how I talk about scenes and stuff but a couple of important things to think about when you look at the material it's like okay so do you have a likable character that's super important to look at like how do we make this character likable that's super important in the introduction of a film if you can't make people care about the character it's not gonna like sit well with the audience in the beginning so that's something that i look at now when i come back to this material like what's a good way of introducing each character and look at like steven spielberg how he introduces characters because that's amazing how he just like has these amazing scenes that just tell so much about a character and and it's just like yeah amazing um, but that's how you want to establish characters to have them leave an impression uh, and not a negative one because that's going to affect how they see the rest of the film so for each film you're going to have to do something but you're going to have to make them likable early on and you're going to have to hook people straight away because people have adhd like me or do i i don't know i never tested myself um yeah i wanted to show like the intro of, of um, 
Pearl of Africa to kind of break that apart, but I think I just skip that and, and maybe do it another time. I've been thinking about doing like a director's commentary of that one, so let me know if that's something that you would be interested in. Um, I think that would be like interesting to do at least to sit and do a commentary like the traditional ones you had on the DVDs. Um, let's see. Okay, a lot of other questions. Okay, good. So, once you have, like, okay, you have a story idea for your film, you need to start to look at, like, the different scenes. So, when I get back now, this is the step that's the most crucial. You do this on location, you review the stuff that you've shot to try to understand what you're shooting, to know what you're gonna shoot next. And now that you're back, it's even more important. So like the next step in, in this whole process, that's gonna be to, to structure everything, like all the scenes that are there, I'm gonna edit them as a scene without a narration or anything like that. It's just gonna play out like cinema verite type of style, fly on the wall aesthetics, just watching the scene, what happens. Just edit it as a, like a human uh, observation of somebody's life. Um, totally uncommented just to see what the stuff is like what do you have there what type of story do you have um, and I do that for every scene that I have uh, and then that becomes the starting ground for trying to like write the story in the edit room so everything just comes down to kind of switch come down to like okay so we have a, a part of this whole uh, shooting sequence where okay it's a lot of driving that's probably going to be like broken out into one scene maybe uh, this stuff when uh, he's out of the car that might be a different one or it's the same one but the the key here is to try to kind of just establish the different sequences figure out what they are like here you have okay the the canoe uh, him just putting it into uh, to the water and and all those things that's going to be like a separate thing because you want to have a progression in the storytelling so you're going to want to have these broken out into scenes and then edit them and let them play out and like play around with them like narrative wise don't be afraid to like just do it as uh, like subjective or uh, just like cinematic as you can but don't go and put voiceover on it. At least that's not what I'm fond of because I just want to see them play out so that I can get a, a, a feeling for the story. And then I would start to like map it out on like post-its or yeah, something and, and put it up on the wall. And uh, I would start to like see the connections between the scenes. Um, and that's like a time consuming process. But when you do that, it's going to be so much easier to understand the story and to kind of pace it. Uh, and then once that's done, you can start putting uh, the whole story into it, which would be like the conflict and all those things that you need to have in words or you don't. Maybe it says itself in, in the scenes as it is. Um, but that's how I would kind of structure the whole, whole thing. Um, and I got this question here, which is like, I have a main ID for my documentary. It's Jose Carlos Vasquez. But in the middle of the production shooting, I feel like the main ID falls apart. Uh, will I continue shooting? Uh, I can find a good ID uh, in post. I keep my main ID or is it better to stop finding a new path? Now, the thing is, in a documentary, I think patience is the biggest thing. Like you could have a character that is just awful, but that could just be you that doesn't have the skills to get them comfortable, or it could be a bad character. But usually, like if you do a rigorous research process and you see like there's something in this character that's like intriguing and there's a story there, then it's probably either you or time. So I would probably stick to it if I thought that it was good but if you've just like tried things out and don't really know like no it doesn't feel like this is going to be something then you might as well you know give it up but 
sometimes you regret that somebody else does it and they saw something that you didn't see but usually i would say just stick through the whole process and like let it play out just keep following and see what happens then once you've done that for a while if you do that for a year or something and you still feel like it's crap then you would go back and you would kind of maybe put it to bed or something or like i've done with a project that i'm just picking up again that's like five years ago i shot that and now i'm starting to pitch it to tv uh, on wednesday so it's it's a totally like random thing that you don't know you maybe you work on something and then it dies and then you come back to it later that's usually how it goes like you want to have several projects in in the pipeline just because that's how it goes so for kino i don't know do we fund it hopefully but if we don't it's probably going to be there and then like grow as time goes and we're going to be pitching it and yeah that's the way it goes usually you don't know you just need to have patience um and the thing is docs always changes as well like for the pearl of africa for instance like everything changed in the beginning it was a story about uh, cleo and her mom uh, and even before that there was different characters so there was like a totally different film uh, i wanted to do like a refugee film with like a in this world by michael winterbottom his uh, his type of like immersive experience with a refugee was what I was after and then I went and I started shooting with Cleo and it was about her and her mom then I went home and then I came back a couple of months later and then she had met this guy and then it started to be like about her and her mother and uh, her new boyfriend and then I went back and I came back again and then um, eventually it turned into a love story and her mom was out of the picture so she's not in the movie and then eventually she had to uh, flee uh, Uganda to Kenya and then her boyfriend came with her and then eventually kind of turned into the original ID which was this immersive uh, refugee story again so it went like full circle uh, but it become or it became a much more interesting and better and, and more unique story because it went full circle. If that would have been like the first initial idea would be in the final film, it would be much crappier. So that's just the way the process is and you just need to like follow through. Um, yeah. And Kino is the same. I went there with one ID and then it starts to like move around and like, okay, now maybe this is a, a TV series. Maybe it's not a feature. So things change. That's just the way it goes. Uh, that's how I look at this material now. I need to figure out like what would be the arcs if I would want to do it as a, um, a feature or a TV series. How would I need to like look at it differently as we're shooting and everything? Because that's probably going to be a big difference. Uh, okay, I'm curious, a waiting table. I'm curious about making the characters more comfortable on camera towards them letting down their guard and how much of these earlier moments tend to be wasted footage uh, just to prep them each time. I think you get so much better with time at these things. I think that nowadays, like there's going to be some weird character if I'm not going to be able to get them comfortable because I've done it for so long. It's usually just you hanging out with them and then they get comfortable. If you're a weird person to hang out with, then you have an obstacle to overcome. But if you're like a dude or gal who's just easy going and easy to hang out with then it's not going to be a problem because then it comes down to just doing that and then you shoot while you do that but you need to talk to people and connect to people and let it take time and don't like be so like forced with the camera all the time you don't have to shoot all the time pick your moments um, or have like a dop like with maddie now it's much easier for me to just get them comfortable and maddie is just uh, just by the side or whatever just getting the shots uh, that's an easier way to get them comfortable so if you have a, uh, a second person there they can shoot then do that especially in the beginning because then that's what takes the most time but for us uh, we cheated a little bit because we we got Chris who's the behind the scenes uh, filmmaker he had done like short films there before 
So we used him for the costing process and, and also as a production manager there. So he al already knew them. So we had that whole process of having to get to know them cut out just because we used him. So try to think about that as well to get people who have connections. Um, yeah. And then uh, a waiting table also asked. Also, the, uh, all the books talk about finding the film's train. How early do you find it develop right that uh, and the sense of momentum uh, that drives the tension? I think this is an ongoing thing. Usually, I would say like the first rough cut, that's usually something that you want to do like chronologically just to get the feel for the story. And the simple reason for that is that it's easier to understand the story if you do it like that. If you don't go out and make it like super fancy narrative wise uh, before you've cut through the whole thing. And then when you have that first way of cutting it, you're going to see patterns. So for Pearl of Africa, for instance, it's actually, if you've seen the film, it's one journey that you, you see when you see the movie. And it's actually a train, uh, a train ride that we come back to through the whole film. Uh, trying not to spoil it, but I need to kind of do <laughs> to explain this. Um, and it's actually shot as like separate journeys. There was one journey to um, Kenya. There was one journey to uh, Thailand. There was one journey within Kenya. So there's a lot of journeys, but it doesn't make sense to tell that to the viewer that there are several different journeys because the truth is that this is a film about one journey how this one woman has to leave her place home what she calls home for a different place to go to a different place to find herself and come back and be herself that's basically the story to tell that in a cinematic way doesn't mean to tell it like chronologically or like how it happened it means to tell it in the most effective way cinematically that like goes through to the audience and for us that was to make it simpler to make it the one journey and not like these several different places and you have to like explain okay now they're in this location now they're in this location it's just messy for people so just simplify the narrative but that i would you would do that all the time but i would definitely like go in and do that at the rough cut stage and that's where like i would be comfortable maybe with like a second or third version of a rough cut before i showed it to other people not like the close people in the in the group that you make the film with but like outsiders i wouldn't show it to um yeah uh, uh, uh let's see What's the biggest expense for docs? Are characters paid for time? I talked about them being paid per diem, but like the biggest thing expense wise is always production costs. And it's always more expensive. If you look at like a previous video when like I talked about budgeting for the first trip, like everything went to shit as we were shooting. Uh, you know, flights canceled, all these things happened, and like there was one place to eat, so the, like everything just messed up. Um, I think that the most expensive thing until you've sh like are at a rough cut stage, if you're not paying yourself, because salaries are always going to be the most expensive thing, but it is just the production cost, whatever that is. Like it's different for everybody. But then, when you're going to sell something, then it becomes more expensive. Because you need all these extra things. You need licensing. You, maybe you need archive licensing. Super expensive. Maybe you need music. Super expensive if you don't have a friend or you can do it yourself. There's so many layers of like all that stuff that comes into the post-production. But even like a, an executive producer... If you have a good name, they might take like 80K or something, US dollars for that, like putting their name and, and opening doors to other money, but they would still like take that. 
so there's like so many different levels to it but to just make a film it is the production cost of it and you can keep that low uh, as long as you have your own gear and stuff um, Ross Bodeman, in terms of structure, I'm curious about how you plan or don't plan to edit scenes of the film. How do you stay motivated getting in and out of flow state? How do you keep uh, things cohesive while editing a project over a longer period? I think it usually it just comes down to doing like the work, just going in and editing all the scenes. Like, it's super dreadful just going in and just like looking at this. Like, I hate this. Like looking at this and knowing that I have to sync all of this, that's gonna suck. But I also know that it just comes down to just doing it. Once you've done that, once you have like, okay, all these clips here, all these different scenes, they've been synced, which is like the first step is syncing the thing. Uh, once you've done that, you start to get inspired. Um, and and once you've gotten to like the inspiration stage where you start to feel things and you feel like okay something is moving here there's something going on then you're gonna have that for a while but like it comes down to doing the the whole practical work of like logging the material organizing it structuring it and trying to automate as much as you can of that but also like doing the whole syncing and editing of the scenes that takes time I love to have assistants do a lot of that. And if you have people that can do that, then that's amazing, even if you're gonna edit it. Because that's the stuff that you don't have to do. You do not have to do that work to piece stuff together. So for Confused African, when we did that one, for instance, uh, Jonathan, who was the editor, he edited all the stuff, like all the scenes, and then he sent those to me and I looked at all the scenes and then I started to piece together the story. Uh, and then from that we started to edit the whole series but that's the way that like you can uh, try to get somebody who can assist you to do that or you do it yourself and then you just need to like put in the time but uh, it is time consuming but you also gain a lot from just looking at material just like let it take time don't force things as well like I think it's Walter Murch that he does barely edits like most of the time you're just like going around thinking about the, the story. Uh, and if you haven't read like In the Blink of an Eye or whatever it's called that he's written, that book is amazing. So go check that out as well because it's about editing and, and more about like in the nitty gritty of editing. Um, yeah, but that's usually like how I think about it. It's like break down the process to steps, like to-do list of whatever you have. Like... Okay, start with the most fun characters, you just get going. Uh, start with the scene you love and, and just start getting into the process of like seeing the material and, and doing that. I hate doing the interviews. That's so boring to listen to like an hour of an interview just to write what they say. But you have to do that stuff. It's dreadful, but you need to do it. Because once you have that done, it's a puzzle, all of this each time you come back from a shoot you want to find things that you can connect to the stuff that you got now and you want to see what you need to get for the next time so you want to have everything in detail um, yeah and it, it's kind of hard to keep track of all that but once i've done all the scenes i usually start to play around with like getting a feel for it but even before this like even now i've cut a trailer of all this so i've already like dabbled in the material but just to get a feel for everything and i haven't synced anything i just do it to get into the project to get a feel for it and to get like a cinematic vibe of it and that's just to make like a pitch trailer but that's the first thing i usually do and and that's just to get me inspired by the project because otherwise if you don't have something to look at that inspires you it's really hard to do that whole dreadful thing of sinking stuff um, yeah how do you film or add transition angles people moving or objects uh, keep people entertained this is gonna suck to hear but if you do transitions and if you rely on them to keep people entertained you don't have a story and you should focus on that I don't like transitions, but uh, like 
City of God, is that what it's called? That's amazing, that film, and it only relies on like visual effects, it feels, and sound effects, and like some people can do it and do it really, really well and still tell a strong ass story, but most people just hide behind those and don't tell a strong story. So I would just like learn the craft of storytelling first and then add transitions if you think it adds something, but probably you don't need it. Yikes. Um, yeah, and here's a question about like chronological order, Gary Lane. Um, yeah, I think edit first to like rough cut stage and then maybe switch it up after that. Just play around with it after that. But usually like it's a better process of just like sticking to your ID in the beginning. Um, let's see what we have here. Do you edit in 4K? Yeah, this uh, Ruben Lopez, like I, what I do usually is I kind of, I structure the whole, like this is the way editors do it and it's just because of the fluidity of everything. So I have two ways of, of working on projects. One is like the short projects, which is like quick turnarounds. Then I would just like do a rough cut basically and then i would like convert all those into like optimized media and have before i go to edit with a client i do not want to sit with a client and have like everything like lagging and and there's always issues so sitting in like 4k or raw or whatever it is like i'm shooting in 12 bits so when you do that and and you try to sit with a client you don't want to do that so you need to make optimized media and that's usually how it goes for every editor they will always do that that's just the process it's been like that forever and i know that that's the way to do it because it saves you so much time but it can be dreadful to know that like okay i need to convert all this material so what i do is i i go in let me just switch so you can see here i go in here in the settings and during the edit process, I would keep like optimized media resolution at half. And then I would do like optimized media format at proxy, ProRes proxy. And then I would just like have these, and this is in the template that you can down in the link or in the description, you have a link if you want to use it. Uh, so I have like, okay, used media, for instance, if you have media that's being used in a timeline, you can go in and like, select all the media in the whole project um, and then once you have all that selected oops uh, you can just update oh crash damn it it crashed on me that's not a good <laughs> marketing campaign for us all too much of the fun stuff okay so anyway what i would do is just okay i go into the project and i would just optimize all the media now there's a lot of media so sometimes that's going to be like too much for the project uh, especially if you're live streaming and doing all these processes of recording to the drive at the same time which obs is doing so then things might happen but usually that does not happen um, but you would select everything and then you would generate did it end up on this screen now? Where did it go? Damn it. Um, here we go. So you would generate optimized media in order for you to edit more fluently. And I would do that in the night. I would select like a batch of things to to kind of convert. Uh, and have that done early in the process and that's just because you don't want to go into the project and do all this at a later stage um, just do it when you're not like into the project and having like tons of stuff to to think about um, yeah so let me just select a couple and show you uh, okay you don't have that if you we don't go into this and then usage let's see okay usage let me just make you see here usage usage okay so you have this thing called usage 
you would select a couple of clips and you would update usage. Uh, and what would happen then is that, okay, so then it would uh, tag it being used. So everything that's being used, I could then go into optimized used and then it would end up there. Or I could take all the 4K material and then just do all that. Um, this should actually not have the JPEG, so you could go in and you could change that. So you see here how like advanced this whole media <laughs> organizing is. So it's basically just like having a bunch of things to think about. Uh, it's not a still. How does it not recognize that as a still? Okay, F file name is not .jpeg. Uh, still has it okay oh well but that's usually how we would do it i would go in and i would do the optimized media on all those files or on everything um, but to kind of not do everything at once i would just go in and i would select a scene for instance so okay i want to do these scenes tomorrow just select all that go and generate optimized media and that would be done and i would do that optimized media thing because a whole uh, when you do a whole um, documentary like this material here is at the moment three days I don't know like four terabytes ish so it's massive um, and if we're just three days into the project so you're gonna need to have optimized media if you want to edit on the go which you probably want to do part of Africa I went to Thailand on a beach edited there and then uh, you might want to have it on a drive like this. 4K is not going to do that. So what I do is I put the optimized media on this drive. I put this as my scratch disk. And then I have that. So I don't need the big drive when I go to some other place. If I want to work on the material or look at the material, I can still do that. Um, yeah, that's how I do it. Long answer to that. Uh, 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 let's see. So many questions. Uh, 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 uh. Slow mo. People don't like slow mo. <laughs> I don't like. I like slow mo. Uh, I actually like. I like it. But I don't think that you can rely on slow motion for um, telling a story. Like if you, if you rely on slow motion uh, to make people care about your film, you don't have a story. That's just something that it's, it's not, it shouldn't be needed. Like I like 25p. I like the feel of that movement of a camera. I think it's more immersive and I think it's more realistic and then you can make it look really pretty. When I look at slow motion, and I mean everybody on YouTube here, I just fast forward to the next thing. I hate the B-roll things. And it just bores me. It's just the same image all over and all over. So that's just like how I feel. Other people feel totally opposite. But I do use like slow motion. Yeah, especially in the BTS thing. And Maddie shoots a lot of slow motion and I like what he shoots. I'm just not the guy to shoot it. Uh, but I do shoot it sometimes. Uh, it's just not that, okay, I, I rarely shoot 120p. I shoot 50p though. Um, yeah, and, and another thing that also happens when you, when you go through the editing process of doing all the all the scenes and stuff an important thing like going through this whole process is to to find the style of the uh, the film and find the look of it uh, and this is something that you do on location as well so uh, in pearl of africa there was like this night that i was out just shooting like b-roll stuff in slow motion by the way <laughs> which is kind of, uh, amazing scene uh, so certain times like i feel like okay okay now this this is how i can explain why i hate slow motion 
slow motion is is useless if you use it all the time but and it's the same with everything if you use music in a whole film it's useless but when you do use it it's it's gotta have a bang it doesn't make sense otherwise so when you do it when you do do slow motion or when you do use music you need to have it have a, a reason for being there to tell a stronger story so the way that I thought about it, and I'm not saying that I, I do everything right, but it's the way that I feel like it works. So there's this scene where you're going into the mind of uh, Cleo and Nelson who's in a surgery room where she's basically dying. Um, and then we move out into the streets of Bangkok and we're not with them anymore. In there, in, in that room that they're in, everything is super still. It's still shot in 25p. It's, it's shot like handheld, but super steady. It's just like super fragile type of feel. And then it goes out into the streets of Bangkok. And then everything is just like really suggestive. Just me like looking at like the street with the, with the lens and then just looking up. Uh, like skyscrapers like some detail of a bush in the streets and like panning and then walking and uh, meeting some people and then I did like all that I edited uh, like did the sound design for in in also like this echoey feeling so you get like this reverb and feeling of it being even more slow motion uh, and that's just to get you as a viewer into that mindset of reflecting and then it makes sense to me then you can do all the slow motion you want but don't do it just because it looks pretty because that doesn't make sense um, and I mean I'm a DOP I've heard so much shit when I go to pitches that, oh, it looks pretty, but there's no story. I've heard that for years. I still hear it all the time. So if I feel that way, imagine what they would think about your slow motion stuff. That's just the way it is. People just care about story. If you look at like the, the doc world, they don't give a damn about it looking good. Netflix do though. And that's why we went with them. But like it's it's totally different in that world uh, compared to like advertising and that's why it's so hard to pitch things because they don't care about the the look of things they just care about the story and that's why it's so hard because you need to write that story to get any funding uh, anyway tangent back to this stuff <laughs> um how do you use a scene that is super this is Matt the Rome, I think. But you feel you forgot to shoot enough. Do you forget about it or try to put it in the documentary because uh, it's so good? There's different like ways of doing it. Like sometimes you just need to like put it in the can and, and not use it. It comes down to kill your darlings in the end. But for instance, it can be a luxury. Uh, we had a couple of scenes, I think, in, in Pearl of Africa that was like this. Where it was like, in the end, it was a couple of seconds. But those seconds was so worth having. There was like one collage. And then there was like the funniest moment in the whole film was in those scenes. That took like, one thing took a whole day to shoot. And it's just like 10, 15 seconds in the end. That's the way, like, it has to be. You have to look at, like, oh, that material is great, but it doesn't fit into the story, and then you throw it away. But maybe there is a moment or there's some shots that, that can be used in, like, a collage or something uh, that feels like super high production value, but it didn't make sense to tell it, like, in the story. Because, like, if you look at Robert McKee's way of looking at, like, scenes, for instance, every scene that's in the movie should be something that, like has a turning point like small turning points and most scenes like in docs might not have that all the time um, and that's why it feels more organic as well but um, it's just like you need to reevaluate all the scenes and all the stuff that you what are you trying to say with everything and that's going to be like ongoing until people have seen it and you, you're fine and put it to sleep ish um, yeah Oops. Uh, let's see. 
<laughs> friendly local is the b-roll as defined by vloggers uh, even actually b-roll now the thing is b-roll is actually just like it, it has a reason in big productions i feel because then you have a, a second unit and all those things it, it, there is like something that actually should have a term that is b-roll but when you look at it like small uh, doc films where you're one person shooting you should probably just look at like what story am i shooting and what images do i need to capture that or what scenes am i trying to kind of get images of trying to tell rather than having like okay now we need this slide here i i have done so many slides i've done so many like that type of stuff but that was like probably seven years ago i did that so something happens eventually you kind of find like okay this is like the right moment of using it and i like it looking pretty but just when it has a reason for looking pretty um, like casey can be a good like casey neistat is a good example of somebody that actually like the time lapses that he uses it pushes you into the story even though it's it's totally shallow it's totally just him just having a fun day it still pushes you into his world and that's what those things should do they shouldn't be just there to like make it look good or make it a transition to be like something that distracts you from not being bored um, but then i also think that like you need to adapt to the place on youtube i edit so much quicker than i do for cinema like it's not even close to being the same tempo but that's just the way you have to accept like the platform you're in as, as well and if everybody would just want to see b-roll then i would do that probably because that's what everybody wants to see but i don't think that that's what everybody wants to see i just think that like that's the easy way of doing it shooting everything in 120p and then like doing that it's going to be a fad in the end people will just think that it's too slow nothing is happening why am I seeing this foot moving in slow motion or feet moving in slow motion for 20 seconds? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, let me see. Let me get some more. So hard to see. Like, what is the. Yeah, Resolve is awful at syncing. It's terrible at syncing. Um, it's it's terrible at like looking at the waveforms. I feel it's great if it's like the good um, good situation. But I rely on time code, so it, for me it's not it's not an issue. And like pluralize or whatever, those are really good. But as I said earlier, like they might not work uh, when you shoot docs because you're not in control of the situations. Um, if you have a boom operator, that person is always going to be close, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Or for instance, one uh, wireless mic dies. I hate wireless mics, but they could die. I just have like these wired labs instead. Same but different a recorder. But the recorders can stop as well. So maybe you don't have that audio. So what do you do then? Yeah, then you have an issue. That's the way things goes because you don't control anything. You just hope the things work and sometimes they don't. And then you need to be creative about it, solving the problem. Um, let's see, what do we have else? I want to change software from Premiere to Resolve, but I need to adapt better. Probably not though, because you can actually have the keyboard shortcuts be the same. Uh, mm, 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 anything else? Do you have a Canon camera? I actually don't think I have one anymore. No. Oh, no, Olympus. <laughs> nope. 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 Have a lens though. Getting it tomorrow, I think. Fixed it. Autofocus was broke. Um what else yes please director's commentary i'm just going back now to see that i don't miss anything that i really want to answer uh what else what else
DaVinci Resolve 14 Studio crash after open new project as well existing project oh, th there was some problem with that one I think what was the issues I think I'm actually not sure we had some issues with the 14 version as well I would try to export the thing and try to import it and hope for the best but otherwise just Blackmagic has a forum and they try to be helpful there um, I think that there is an issue though it, you need to look at like if you work with Resolve you need to look at what type of uh, system you have if it's good enough because like the 14 version I know was like dreadful if you don't have enough power in the computer but usually it's like the drives are they too slow is the um, graphics card not even uh, acceptable those types of things are usually the issue uh, let's see so hard to get through all this people was active today so just like before i am um, down in the bottom what do you think about uh, like doing sessions like this which is more like practical being like in the program and then like talking about it being like more i don't know like a lecture ish type of thing for the live streams feels like it's more engaging I don't know, maybe it's just the subject. Editing is, is a big subject. Maybe it's just me understanding how uh, tagging and all those things, thumbnails work. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I don't think there's anything that I s have to get to. Okay, so just to finish up, like this whole uh, process, like th this video was like a first trial in like how I would uh, do a live edit session. I'm thinking now that I would do, because this is just me importing the project today, so I haven't even had time to log it. So. I I was thinking of doing a series like this. I'll probably cut these down as well. That's why I'm shooting like two cameras and all. Um, but this was the first trial. So should I continue doing like this with this project as it progresses? Should I look at like, okay, editing a scene maybe? Um, what type of things in the, in the process of editing a feature doc or whatever this ends up being, would you like to know? Like syncing and all those things, I'm guessing I can just skip and get to the the nitty gritty of editing and storytelling that's what's fun to me at least but let me know what you think um, and let me know if there's something else that I can just answer uh, afterwards but yeah that's just like my thoughts on on how to edit uh, or structure before you you begin to edit it's so many steps that I would like to like go in more into detail and maybe I'll do that if I cut this down or anything but I'll leave this up as, as a live stream uh, okay that's it for today so uh, take care and uh, goodbye and uh, see you soon bye bye